Let's look at our passage of scripture this morning. Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 34. Then he went down to Capernaum, being Jesus, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. Let's pray. (coughs) Thank you, Father. Uh, Thank you, Father, for just giving us this time to talk. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son. Thank you that he not only came, but he rose from the grave. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the power that's present and the drawing that takes place. Thank you for your word and its power. Lord, I ask as we go through this service, this time of preaching, that you would bless every part of it. In Jesus' name, amen. The names that I gave you are some guys that are worth, <coughs> excuse me, are worth listening to. If you've never heard them, come back. I'll give you the names again. Uh, I'd love for you to listen to some of these people because they are mighty in the pulpit, they're mighty in the Word of God, and they will teach you things that you need to know being a believer. The reason they're worth listening to is that they're authoritative teachers. Authority, exousia in the Greek, means to do as one pleases within a specific realm. Scripture speaks of authority in several different ways. Uh, Sometimes the authority that's talked about is magisterial authority. Okay, You could have authority as a king, you could have authority as a ruler, and that is a person that can do as they please within their specific realms. But there are also places where there is spiritual authority. And spiritual authority, obviously you would have Jesus Christ, but... We wouldn't want to think about it this way, although it's absolutely true. Angels, as well as Satan himself, has a certain amount of authority that was doled out by God. The apostles have been given authority. The twelve, even with the replacement that was there, had authority. They had authority to do many of the same things that Jesus did in that same power. They could do as they pleased. Even though power has been doled out throughout the world, the greatest power in the universe will always stand, will always be God himself. In submission to the Father, Jesus was imbued with that same exousia or authority. Right before Jesus gave the Great Commission, he said this in Matthew 28, 18. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority had been given to him. During Jesus' ministry, he had a great amount of power. He had power to be able to heal the sick. Now, it didn't matter if they had cancer. It didn't matter if they had a withered limb. It didn't matter what was going on in their life with a high fever like we will soon see with Peter's mother-in-law, which he was married. But he had that power. He had the power to do as he pleased. He had the power to heal the sick, the lame, the diseased, and he could even delegate that power over to other people. The spectacular or supernatural will always cause people to talk. What we would call it today is sensationalism. Something sensational happens, it gets people talking. That seems to be what they focus in on. A magician with a good trick can cause people to talk. But being able to deliver the word of God in such a way that it literally astonishes or amazing, amazes people is something that only God can do. It's a God-given gift. What Jesus walked into in his day were rabbis and elders who were teaching the same things over and over again. 
They were teaching as was custom. So when Jesus enters the scene and he starts teaching on some of the same passages of Scripture and they hear him going through it, they're blown back by the words that he says and the way that he delivers it. That's what was going on there. Today we can have that same power if we deliver to people the word of God as it's given. Amy Carter brought an assignment home one Friday night while her father was still president. Stumped by the question on the Industrial Revolution, she went to her mother and she said, Mom, I need to know what to do. I can't answer this question. Her mother, Rosalind, then turned over to seek aid and they went over to the Labor Department. As they went to the Labor Department, a rush was placed on the assignment that was due Monday because they thought that it was from the president himself. Now you remember that when Jimmy Carter was in office, they had computers, but they weren't many. So that weekend, they cranked up, and this cracked me up in, in the story, they cranked up the computer. They cranked up the computer, and they kept it going the entire weekend with the labor department, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, the way our government runs, so that they could have the answer delivered by truck. It was so many papers that they had to print out to the White House. The next day, Amy, with a big smile on her face, Walked into her history teacher's class, gave her the paper, and received a C. <laughs> With great authority, people listen, and you can get them moving. There's no greater authority than the Word of God. When we clearly teach the truths found therein, there is a profound effect on people. Isaiah says this in his holy scriptures in Isaiah 55, 11, So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty or void without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. Teachers who are armed with the word of God have power by nature of the material alone. Our passage today was written to detail the qualities that describe an authoritative teacher. Do you recognize authoritative teaching when you hear it? Because it may not be what you think it is, according to Scripture and according to our passage today. This morning, I'm going to give you two points. Each one will give the position of the authoritative teacher. The first one says this, authoritative teachers astonish people. At times, I believe the natural inclination of the reader is to look at the exorcism of this passage that we just read. Who in here is familiar with the passage that we just read? It's a pretty common one that comes into church from time to time. And when we read it, we look at the exorcism, we look at the demon, but folks, that's not what calls the demon to speak up. What calls the demon to speak up was Jesus, God, Holy Word incarnate standing before them preaching the gospel in such a way that the demon could not contain himself. If you walk away from here thinking that this passage is about exorcism, I've got news for you. It doesn't work the way that the television programs have played it out to be. I tried it one day, walked up to a woman that I thought was possessed and I said, leave her now! She just looked at me and said, could you just leave me alone? <laughs> a little background in the passage is given in verse 31. It says, then Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. If you remember our passage of study, Jesus was in Nazareth before. He had gone into Nazareth, he's almost knocked off, he's about to be killed, and now he goes back into Capernaum where he makes this his home base. It's literally where he was going to live a good majority of his ministry. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 13 it says, In leaving Nazareth he settled in. You see that? He settled in Capernaum which was by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. 
Capernaum is located on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. You see it here in this picture if your eyes are spectacular, but that's where it's at. Capernaum means city of Nahum, and if you go and flesh it out a little bit, it could also mean the place of rest. Now, nobody really knows if that place was named the city of Nahum after the prophet or not, but this is where Jesus did a great bit of his ministry. If Jesus would have had some sort of modern-day ministry, there's no way he would have been able to preach or teach like he was during that time. You say, well, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, if you look back, they had tried to kill Jesus by pushing him off a brow of a hill. And supernaturally, he walks through the midst of them to his freedom, where now he's preaching again and he's teaching. He didn't stop. You see, if something like that would have happened to modern-day preachers, here's what they would have done. They would have gone and received counseling. They would have had to go and talk to somebody for a little while to work it out, and then they would have got on the computer and they would have blogged about it for a little while. Because that's the next natural step in what we do today. And if that didn't work, they'd go on the Today Show and tell everybody what happened. I'm a pastor. I was almost murdered. I can't do my ministry right now. That was not Jesus. That's what I love about this passage of Scripture. They attempted to murder him. They attempted to kill him. They attempted to kill him for blasphemy. They attempted to push him off of a hill. And he said, well, if you don't want me here, I'll go find a place that does. I'll just keep on preaching. And that's what he did. He went on and he continued to preach. Has your ministry got so bad where people have tried to kill you? I'd wager to say in this room that hasn't happened to any of us. But again, Jesus was almost killed and he kept on preaching. He kept on teaching. Street evangelism is wonderful, but having a captive, religiously obligated audience is even better. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he's still preaching on the Sabbath. Israel was bound under their self-inflicted rules and regulations. Jesus took advantage of that situation. They were going to the synagogue. He just went to a place where he could preach. He went to a place where he knew that they would be. They had to be there because this is the way they set things up above and beyond what the law had to say. Yes, they were supposed to gather. Yes, they were supposed to meet and worship God. But the way that it was regulated and set up was man-made. That's why Jesus said this in Mark chapter 2, verse 27. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. But it had been turned on their head to the point where people had to do what those around them said for fear of not meeting those personal obligations. You know, as I looked at this passage of Scripture, I began to think about what was actually ordained by God and what wasn't. And these people were coming into worship, is what we call it. They were coming together, we could do a modern day parallel as the church, they were coming together because this is what they were told to do. Now, mom and daddy would raise up Billy and little Sue, and they'd say, okay, you come on, this is what we have to do. It's not what we get to do. Do you see the difference? This is what we get to do. Folks, when you come into this room, this is what you get to do. And it evolved into something that it wasn't. The Sabbath actually means rest, or probably more accurately to say they cease. They were supposed to cease from activity because they were working hard all this week. Now, if they take too many steps in a given day, they're not keeping the law according to tradition during that time. So they're afraid. They're afraid of the wrath of God falling down on them. They're fearful of what he might do. That's not the Sabbath, but I'll tell you what the Sabbath is. The Sabbath is still a time where you come into a place, you meet with God's people, and you learn from the Word of God. That's what it still is. You see, what he was trying to do is get after their mind. He knew that they were supposed to be there. You see, we changed it ourselves, didn't we, many years ago? I could have walked into most Baptist churches and I could have said, Happy Sabbath day to you and everybody had gone about their business. But we know, according to Scripture, that the Sabbath is actually what day? Saturday. 
You see, we've made Sunday into something that it wasn't. We had started calling it the Sabbath. You know what? It's good to rest one day a week, amen? But you never shut off your mind. You never shut off your mind. You should always be learning about the Lord. You should always be going before Him in prayer. You should always be talking to Him about what's going on in your life. This is what the people should have been doing. Not making sure that God didn't pour out His wrath to the extent that they exploded. But that's the way that the people felt. I'm going to adjust this. Excuse me. In verse 32... It says, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. When Jesus spoke, he did so in a way that the people were not used to. The word astonished comes from the Greek word ekpleso, and it's a compound word. Basically, ek means origin or out of, and pleso means to flatten. So what they're saying in the Greek here is when Jesus began to speak, he flattened them with his words. The mental picture that I got in my mind, it was that of a baker who was rolling out dough. You know, you have it in a ball, you've worked it for a little while, then you go and get the rolling pin. And you take the rolling pin and you begin to push and push and push. I've never done this. I'm not planning on it. But you push, you push, and you roll it out. You flatten it out. This is what Jesus did with his words. He flattened out the people with their words. They were taken back, didn't know what to do with him. Anytime our faults or preconceived notions are challenged by the word of God, the result is being flattened out, is being astonished. If you have vehemently believed something to be true and then found out it was a farce, the impact is not easy to overcome. For centuries, people believed that Aristotle was right and that if an object was heavier, it would fall faster. Now, I really didn't know that that wasn't true until I read this article, but I'm kidding, kind of. But they believe this. You have one object that weighs 10 pounds, another object that weighs one pound, and you drop them, you know, it's obviously the 10 pounds going to reach the ground faster. But that was not true. Galileo, 2,000, some 2,000 years later in 1589, gets up and he pulls a bunch of professors to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And when he gets there, he takes a 10-pound weight and he takes a 1-pound weight. And this story is so great to what we're talking about. But he takes them and he pushes them off the edge and they fall down to the ground and reach the ground at the exact same time. The professors that watched during that time saw exactly what happened and still yet they denied seeing the truth with their own eyes. They denied that something of unequal weight would reach the ground at the same time. There are some things that you've been taught that are so ingrained in your mind that I literally can pull out this book and it has happened and begin to read through it and people will say, uh-uh, that's not what I was taught. Do you know how much that happens to me? Do you know how many times I will be going through a Bible study and I'll see something that is not accurate that I'll t I was taught and I have to change that? It happens all the time. There have even times when I've done research for a sermon and it wasn't exactly what it needed to be and that had to be changed later on. When Jesus came in and he began to teach the people, he taught them with such authority that it astonished them. It astonished them because when he spoke, it was like God on Sinai reaching out to their minds and they said, something's got to change. Or I'm just going to be scared and cower in the corner. Can't tell you how much I look forward to audibly, think about this, to audibly hearing Jesus teach. I, I, let me, let me ask you this. Have you, have you ever got done with a movie? I know that this is messed up, but just go with me on this. Have you ever got done with a movie? And you were just like, oh. I mean, it, it, it threw you back in your seat, and the message was so powerful. Or may, maybe you had heard a sermon, and the same kind of impact happened, or possibly a Sunday school lesson. You're like, why didn't I think of that before? 
every time Jesus spoke, that's what was happening to the people. And it tells us in Scripture that one day, here, he's going to come and speak. And we're going to be able to hear him. Listen to what it says in Micah 4.2. Many nations will come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of God, of Jacob, that he may, what's that church? That he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Do you look forward to that time? Next, I want you to see how authoritative teachers agitate people. My presence proves this. In verses 33 and 34, Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God unnoticed by the rest of the congregation. There was a day that this man walked in. But it was a normal day. It was a Sabbath day. And yes, they did have the rules. Yes, they did have the regulations. And yes, he was just following them. And it looked very pious and it looked very righteous. And he walked through the door and here's what he did. He saw the people that he knew. Had a smile on his face. He walked up to them. He shook their hand. He said, hey, how you doing? Is your son all right? I I noticed last last week that he was running outside in the neighborhood and he skinned his knee. Is he doing okay now? Oh, yeah, he's, he's doing good. Hey, 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 how's that business taking off? Is that working out good? Good, good. It's good to see you. Hugs all over. And then what he did, you know, I think he was Baptist too. He went and found his own seat. He goes and he sits down. And he begins to listen for the word of God to be taught. This man had been doing this religiously for we don't know how long. If there's ever been a passage of scripture that should bother the church, it's this one. Think about it. People could walk through these doors. They could sit down among the congregation. They could do their thing. And yet, they don't know the Lord. They're not, they're not saved. They're just sitting down. They've got their smiley faces on. They're plastic people doing what plastic people do. Going through the motions. And that's what this guy was doing. You know, I thought to myself, maybe he went because he was obligated, like he had to go. Like he had to get in there. Because if he didn't go, people would show up at his house and say, Hey, toot, toot, toot. what are you doing not coming and visiting with us, uh, gathering with us on the Sabbath? Why didn't you do that? And then I thought to myself, you know what? If the word wasn't being taught the way that it should, maybe this guy was truly worshiping. You say, how would that be? He was demon-possessed. Let me make something very clear to you that doesn't make me popular as a pastor, but I don't really care. If you're not teaching the Word of God, if you're not following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're in any other religion in the entire world, then you're worshiping Satan himself. So maybe this guy loved to be there. Maybe when he came in, he was just truly comfortable being in that place because the Word of God wasn't being taught the way that it should. But still you have to wonder how something like this could be possible. Demons work for the devil and they're identified in many different ways throughout Scripture. They're known as gods, formerly stars of heaven, spirits in prison, angels who sin, familiar spirits, evil spirits, principalities, unclean spirits. And our current passage of Scripture describes them as an unclean demon. 
they're identified that way for a specific reason. Luke isn't just trying to use colorful language when he talks about an unclean demon. This demon was foul. It had an attitude that was gross in the sight of God. It was unwanted in the presence of God. You see, in order for us to enter the throne room of God, we must be clean. Washed by the blood of the Lamb. And this was an unclean demon. He was a stench in the nostrils of God. Being before a holy God, he couldn't take himself being there. He was an unclean spirit that found his home in a place that was unclean. In anguish, the demon-possessed man cried out and asked Jesus to let them alone. Plural, let them alone. From time to time, I'm asked this question. Can a person be a Christian and be demon-possessed? No. No, you can't be a Christian. You, you can't have light mixed with darkness. That's not going to work. If you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you cannot be demon-possessed. However, you can be demonized. You can be demonized, and we see that very thing happening in Scripture. Instead of coming in and living inside of a person for a little while, you can have a demon that comes upon a person to influence them. And folks, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer in here, chances are that a demon has come after you at some point. Have you walked away from talking to somebody and said, man, that was just demonic? But they're believers. I'll give you the best passage of Scripture to deal with this. Once when Jesus was asking his disciples who they said they were, he said this in Matthew 16, 23. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, uh, for you are not setting your mind on the interests of God, but man's. Satan did not indwell Peter. That's not what happened. But he was influencing him during that time. The man that we're talking about in our story was indwelt. Today, you may not be indwelt, but if you're not prayerfully prepared, then you can be demonized. Demonic possession doesn't just happen, it comes through invitation. The man in this account said, let us, look at this, let us alone, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth, did you come to destroy us? Now, you're not going to be walking down the street one day and a demon just come in and possess you. That's not the way Scripture talks about it happening. It treats you almost like a house where you leave all the windows and doors open, and if you do that for too long, what comes in? Anything outside. Okay? Most of the people that are demon-possessed that are in our world today, because I believe this is a reality, these people have delved into the occult. It could have looked really moral could have looked really righteous. And they were pursuing this isolation, this solitude, and yet because they opened themselves up to the occult, anything apart from Christianity, Walter Martin could define that better for you, but anything apart from that, if you went that direction, you could be demon-possessed. I don't believe it just happens because you're in a certain place doing a certain thing. Some people would come back to me and say, Roy, I really don't like that. What about children? Well, there are occasions in Scripture where children are demonically possessed. Go back and look at it for yourself. How does that happen? Well, I think if they're in that environment where it's going on and they invite that into their life, that's how it happens. The man that was in our passage was demonically possessed. Because of the powerful preaching of Christ, the possessed man asked two questions. First... He said, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? He was basically saying, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? The simple answer to that question is nothing. Light has no part with darkness. It's fascinating that they not only identified Jesus, but where he was from. If you read this passage and think about it for a little while, Jesus had been in his living conditions with his mother and father for close to... 30 years. 
do you think that the spiritual hierarchy that's in place right now didn't have tabs on where the Holy One of God was at? Think about this. For somewhere around 30 years, they're watching God in the flesh grow up. God came down. He took on flesh. And you think demons aren't going to be watching that kind of stuff? But he had basically been in the same locale of Nazareth for all that time. And then his ministry began, and he starts traveling around, and he starts preaching. And he gets into Capernaum, and when he gets there, they're like, what are you doing here? It's unsettling for them because he's in a place that he hadn't formerly been in. His arrival and teaching seriously agitated them. Second, the possessed man said, did you come to destroy us? You need to pay close attention to this one. When we hear the word destroy, we think annihilation, right? This is what we're thinking about. We're thinking about something being blown into pieces. But in the Greek there, it's actually talking about loss of well-being. So what he's saying is, is why are you here? Because I'm about to lose my well-being. This is the reason I think that you've come. We've kept tabs on you all these years. Now you've shown up. Why are you here? What's going on for you to be here in this synagogue at this time? Why are you here? Did you come to destroy us? Did you come so that I would lose my well-being? If you go a couple chapters over, you're going to get to a point where Jesus runs into a man that's possessed by, he identifies himself by the name of Legion. You remember the story? Because you have thousands of demons that are inside of this man. And they beg him at that point not to throw him, not to throw the demons into the abyss. So he puts them in the swine, they run off the cliff, and all that's happening. This is what this demon thinks is about to happen. He thinks that Jesus is about to pull him out and throw him into the, the abyss. He's about to lose his well-being. You see, a spirit can't be destroyed. Once God creates a spirit, it's here forever. You see, you have demonic spirits and you have angelic spirits and you know what everybody in this room has a spirit in them and it'll never be destroyed it'll always be around scripture makes it clear that if we die not knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior we go to hell okay that spirit is around for eternity but if we die knowing Jesus Christ we're eternally going to be with him this thing is driving me crazy All right, so that's where you would go. The spirit thought he was going to lose his well-being. In the book of Revelation, we know that the pit that's talked about is going to be unlocked. And all of the worst of the worst, the spirits that are in there are going to come out and they're going to plague the earth during that time. So when that takes place, Jesus is going to come back sooner or later. He's going to judge the earth and then he will eliminate them altogether. He'll take every demonic spirit that's out there and he will lock them up along with Satan himself. For a thousand years we'll see peace and teaching like we've never seen before. So what was it that finally agitated that demon, possessed man enough to speak up? It was the fact that the Holy One of God had spoken with such authority that it challenged him. It challenged him. It moved him out of his normal routine of life. He was fine with just going through things the way that they had been. But now Jesus was standing there. And he was being challenged in a way that it had never happened before. I don't know if this happens, although I hope I stumble across it from time to time. But maybe in a sermon, when I'm preaching, something comes out through the scripture beyond me that you're just gripping your pew and saying, I need to deal with this sin. Is God so clearly shining that light down on what's decaying in your life that you know you need to do something about it? I'm not ever going to come in here and have a deep voice. I'm not going to turn a phrase so dramatically that it makes you jump out of your seat and write it down. I'm never going to say something that sounds exactly super spiritual. But folks, I'll tell you what's in the Word of God, and that alone 
will be enough to challenge you. One of the greatest problems in the modern evangelical church is minimal truth. Far too long the church has been as if it were prisoners receiving rations. We give them a little. I'm not willing to do that to you. I'm not willing to barely walk in here and feed you as if it were communion and say that's your meal for today. I want you to walk out feeling like you've been fed from the word of God, like you know what's in that passage of scripture, even if it bothered you. I think that that happened for so long that the church degraded. It went to a place that it had never been before. Some of the men that I mentioned that were great expositors of the truth and the word of God challenged their people so much simply by teaching through it that the people couldn't wait to get back the next Sunday. Are you fine with coming to church as long as you don't have to meet with Jesus? Sounds like an insane question, right? But that's what happened in this passage, right? This man was fine with coming to synagogue as long as he didn't have to meet with Jesus. You know, go to Sunday school. Check. Give your offering. Check. Shake the appropriate hands. Check. Say the right prayer. Hug the right people. Check. Check. You think that all these things are great as long as you don't have to come and meet with Jesus. The reason that you come in here today is to meet with Jesus. That's why you're coming. That's why you've shown up here. If you think you come just because it's something that you have to do, you have your priorities all messed up. I come into this place to worship Jesus and to teach you the truth. And if I've done those things, I've done what I should. Do you come into this place to worship Jesus, or is it just what you do out of habit? I mean, think about it. Some habits are not bad. I get that. I get that. Let's get people in a habit to come into church because they can't do it on their own. You know, they, it, Let's get them in that mode of going to church. That is a good thing. But folks, when you walk through these doors, you should be thinking about worshiping the Most High God. That's the reason that we come in here today. That's the reason that we gather, sing, and pray. Are you fine with coming to church as long as no one messes with your well-being? I like things to stay just the same. Do you like things to stay just the way that they've been so that you're not challenged? What happened in this passage of Scripture? Was that man that was possessed challenged? Absolutely he was. And because of that, change was brought about. Change had to happen. Because where the word of God meets sinful man, it will not return void. It's not going to happen. So the word of God comes out, is challenging the people, and one of them can't contain himself because the demon that's inside of him has got to get out. He thinks he's about to be sent to the abyss. He's terrified. Folks, if you're a child of God, you've got to change. You can liken it to growing up. If I look back over the last 15 years, some things have happened to the body. I got fat, more wrinkles. Anybody understand with me on that one? There was change because I was growing older. Folks, if you're growing older in the Lord, there's change. There has to be change. And when those challenges come your way, you at first might say, hey, 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 I don't like that. It's, it's almost too much for me. But then you accept it as the word of God, and he makes you into that creature he wants you to be. Authoritative teaching challenges people. It agitates people. It also astonishes them. Are you changing? Psalm 107, verse 35. Look at this closely with me. The Lord changes a wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. 
Now, you think the Lord's going to do that with the landscape and not the people? Has the authoritative teaching of the Word of God challenged you? Has it agitated you? Has it astonished you? Because we're simply pointing out the truths that are there. That's one of the greatest parts of my job is I get to stand up here and go through what I've learned out of the Word of God. And if I do my job well enough, all I'm doing is repeating what's already there. Today I'd challenge you. I want to say, if you have something in your life that needs to be dealt with, the scriptures have motivated you that much, the Holy Spirit has convicted you, and come and deal with it. I don't care if you deal with it from your pew. I don't care if you deal with it up here. Then I would love to see you. If you need to come and pray and talk about a relationship, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to talk to you about that. Folks, you can't be saved unless you humbly acknowledge your sins in the presence of an all-powerful, all-holy God. He is the one that saves you. Okay, He's the one that does that work in your life. But if you want to talk about that relationship, I'll be available here today. Jesus died on the cross. He can save you from your sins. And I wonder where you're at today. Go to the Lord and talk to him about it first. Then come to me if you'd like to pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And God, I don't know right now if there's somebody in here that doesn't know you Father I don't know if there's somebody that has been demonized or demon possessed although Lord I have fervently prayed against that but Father if there's somebody who doesn't have the freedom to act I ask that you give them that today I ask that your spirit would move and convict and Father we would continue to worship as you see fit In Jesus' name, amen.